last lecture of the term that's not a review, so Friday we'll review. Uh, but today we're going to talk, sorry, this bug on the slide, I'll fix it after class, about Atlantis, uh, robust, extensible execution environments for web applications. So this is a paper by James Mickens and Mohan Dawan. Uh, James is a researcher at Microsoft Research, who was recently a visiting professor at MIT. Um, and this is really, so this paper takes us a little bit out of some of the sort of core topics we've talked about in the class, but I think it's a nice uh, way to look at the impact of exokernel design principles, because the way James describes this is really as an exokernel web browser. Okay, so no new members of the 100 Hundred Club, sadly. Um, I'm hoping that uh, we'll pick up some over the next week. There's some groups that are getting pretty close. Um, so uh, we're currently at 83% for the course evaluation, so I am going to release a medium answer question again as soon as I write them. And I promise I will do this by Friday afternoon. I'm going to start writing the exam tomorrow. As soon as I write these questions, I will release them. You guys will have several days to look at them. But I'm hoping that by the time tomorrow rolls around, we'll be at 90%. And I'll be able to release half of the points on the exam uh, before the exam starts. Okay, so today, now I thought about writing slides for this, uh, but here's the problem. Uh, you, you can't out Mickens James Mickens. This is an actual picture of James Mickens that I found on the internet. I'm not kidding. This is not photoshopped in any way. Uh, it's a little, he's not quite that wide. Uh, the picture is a little uh, out of scale. Uh, but yeah, so he is also in uh, several bands. All of his bands uh, consist of one person, which is James Mickens. So uh, he's in a several, several one-man bands. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do today, for the first time this semester, the first time in 421, 521 history, is show a video um, of James giving the presentation for this paper at SOSP in 2011. Now here's the only problem, and you may be able to tell this already. For some reason, SOSP 2011 was like filmed from outer space or something. Like this, this video is incredibly blurry. It's, it's, that's just not the preview, it's all just about that blurry. So you can't really see it. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to uh, use James's PowerPoint slides, um, and I will play the audio and try to keep the slides in sync. So let's see if this works. Okay, there we go. Now over here, oh, don't do that, don't do that, no. Oh, this is sad. Okay, well, I guess what I'm going to do is go over here. I'm going to play the talk. So I'm going to pause a couple times during this just to sort of answer questions. So, so look, um, and, and again, this is, I think, one of the best illustrations of the design principles. Feel free to stop. Uh, you know, clearly James doesn't care if we interrupt him. So uh, if you guys have questions, just raise your hand and I'll pause the video. Um, but, you know, d despite what you know or do not know about web browsers, and he's going to get into this in more detail, um, current web browsers are forced to implement this incredibly complex and large API. So modern web browsers do things like layout, they do things like parsing HTML, they have to run JavaScript in the web browser, which is like a Turing complete programming language. They're forced to deal with all sorts of new uh, media types that are part of the HTML5 standard. 
And so what happens, and again, he's going to get into examples of this, is that it's very difficult for every web browser, and maybe impossible for web browsers to implement those uh, protocols consistently. So how many of you guys have ever done any web programming or web development? Okay, how many of you guys have ever noticed that things look different on different browsers? The same code. So this is, you guys are kind of used to this, but this is ridiculous, right? Like this is not okay. Like we've grown up with this, you guys have grown up in this sort of broken, broken world, right? Um, and imagine if, because the, in theory, the web browser is supposed to do the same thing. So imagine if different uh, versions of Linux do system, uh, uh, sort of treated the system call interface differently. So for example, if you did a read on one version, you might get a read from where the last read took place. You might have to move the file pointer on one version, but on another version. So it's this sort of, these type of quirks that drive well developers nuts. And so James's idea is look. And, you know, in addition to the correctness issues of just getting things to look right, which is really frustrating for web programmers, there's also all these security problems that are caused by this massive code base that the web, uh, that the browser has to support. And so James's idea is let's, and, and, and remember, remember the exokernel design principle. Operating systems are in charge both of multiplexing resources and providing abstractions, but they don't have to do both. I don't have to intermix the two. And so, what we're going to end up with here is a very, very stripped down exokernel, which is responsible for doing very simple things, like he pointed out. For example, drawing pixels to the screen. That's a very simple interface. And everything else that you're used to being part of the browser web stack is now going to come along with the web page. And web pages can specify the execution environment they want. Do you guys understand the design principle here? All right, let me, uh, let me let James continue to motivate this because it's, uh, it's pretty funny. Why do you need another browser? After all, you can refer to a special kind of exciting content, like Fonzo, like Weird in the app, like online dating, and pictures like this. It doesn't even matter if it's real. Now, that's all very true. Right. But
right, so questions about this? How many people have used things like jQuery? Yeah. No. <laughs> Never believe anything James says, especially if it's accompanied by a huge picture of a teddy bear with its head cut off. Right? <laughs> that's, your, that's your clue that that's, uh, that's sarcasm, right? Um, but this is a huge pain in the butt, right? Like if you guys have written, I use jQuery, right? And probably uh, before seeing some of these examples, I would have responded the same way that these mythical professors that James spends time talking to would do, which is I would say, who cares, right? I mean, the right way to deal with this problem is to build JavaScript libraries like jQuery that are able to hide the complexity. Right? But if you guys have written code for websites, you know, particularly, I mean, I always find this with layout. I only recently started to actually write much JavaScript and do sort of client-side JavaScript coding, which is really cool. But even when you're trying to get layout, I mean, how many people have, have had to use weird layout techniques that tried to get things to work on multiple browsers because they just wanted something simple to work? Right? Like, I want to be able to center something. You don't think that would be so difficult, and yet you end up with four lines in your CSS file, one of which is parsable by, you know, uh, WebKit, one of them is parsable by IE version 7, and, you know, if you want to talk about IE pre version 6 or something, just forget about it because it's like a whole different standard for HTML. It doesn't even, it's nowhere close, right? So you have to sort of give up on those people that are using those old browsers. Now, maybe those people deserve to be abandoned anyway because they should update IE. Um, and stop using IE altogether in general, but, um, but anyway. So, I mean, if you guys have done web programming, you've probably encountered these sorts of problems, despite the fact that things like jQuery have been around for a long time. Uh, but the, but the, but so, so let me allow him to use some examples to try to convince you why jQuery is not a magic bullet. So, jQuery versus browser, round one. Now, the standard view design says an official three-phase event model, 
So I, I think this is a good place to just stop and see if uh, PowerPoint will bring the slide up again or not. Uh, let's try to give PowerPoint another chance. Oh, now it's totally. There we go. All right. So, so again, I mean, the, the way to map this onto operating systems, particularly onto exokernels, is to sort of think of, and it's more complicated because, which is funny, right, given that it's a web browser, it's an application. But you can think of the program that's running, right? So remember back to last class and when we talked about virtualization, it's a lot of effort made to preserve what it was referred to as the application binary interface. So that's the assumptions that applications that are compiled for a particular architecture make that allow them to run on a bunch of different machines that run the same operating system. That's the reason you can use tools that install binary programs on your computer that have not been compiled against the libraries that you're using because there's a agreement between the kernel and the uh, application that is expressible at the binary level. There's agreement about how to perform system calls, what those system calls are going to do, et cetera. So this is a good interface. Um, the problem with web browsers is, think about it. I mean, web browsers get HTML sources that they have to convert into both a DOM tree in order to allow them to be manipulated by JavaScript, but also render them. Right, so those are two separate places where I can get things wrong. Then the browser also has all this CSS that's supposed to parse, right? And that's sort of its own, that's its own language, right? I mean, I've got, so I've got to take that, I've got to map that onto the HTML and combine the two in some way in order to affect the markup, in order to affect the, what things look like. Then I've got all this JavaScript that comes down with the page, which is, again, a Turing-complete programming language that is allowed to do all this stuff. And if that wasn't bad enough, JavaScript is maybe the worst language, in my opinion. There's a lot of things about JavaScript that I like a lot. But if I was going to give people, if, if I was going to give, you know, millions of web programmers a language that they could force other people to run who are only guilty of the sin of having browsed to their website, JavaScript is not the language I would have chosen. Um, it has a lot of these, you know, James just showed you as these sort of funky properties where you can do, uh, you can manipulate JavaScript in ways that are not particularly, uh, that, are, that are exciting if you know what you're doing and terrifying if you don't know what you're doing or you don't trust the person who's trying to do it. Um, and so to some degree, you know, you can think of the browser as providing an interface. That's what browsers do. That interface is huge and it's complicated and it's, as he, as he pointed out, despite the fact there are all these standards about how this stuff is supposed to work, multiple people at multiple companies at various points in time have sat down and tried to implement those standards and produce very different results. And so that creates all these problems that you're trying to solve. All right. Okay. Let's, let's let James continue. Design.
All right, so this is another place where I just want to stop and sort of you know, highlight the, the analogy to, to the things we talked about in the class. So, so, you know, this is, you know, if you guys remember back to microkernels, the idea was I would reduce the, and, and, and I think there's more security implications here, I would reduce the trusted code base, the part of the code that uh, really has permission to do certain things. Because in, in the monolithic browser world, you can think of all of that code, all the code that's required to parse and execute JavaScript, all the code that's required to parse and execute HTML, as sort of the equivalent of running in the kernel. Right? It's privileged code. Now, it's not running in the kernel kernel. It's running in the web browser kernel. But what does this allow it to do? What are some of the things that you know, a malicious web browser, or if I can trick the web browser into doing certain things that it's not supposed to do, what are the types of things that I can accomplish here? I mean, why, would, why do people care about web browser security? Yeah. Yeah, so that's, a, so that's a great point, right? The web browser, you entrust the web browser with a bunch of stuff. Right? Frequently, those uh, password uh, systems aren't particularly good, but you, you, you know, it's a convenience. We use them to fill in credentials and stuff like that. But what else? Let's say you don't do that. Let's say you don't bother with that. I'm not going to, I don't trust my web browser to store this stuff. What else is going on normally? Yeah. Well, yeah, okay. So the point, yeah, there is, there's a lot of chances for a website. If I can trick you to go into a website, if I can launch a phishing attack to get you to go to a website that looks like that one, maybe you don't, you know, so you might go to an, a, a website that's trying to attack you, and you might say, oh, I can tell this isn't the, you know, this isn't the Bank of America website. I can see it doesn't even look right, you know, and, and then you navigate away. But in the process, that site has sent down some JavaScript is running your browser already, okay? So if there are vulnerabilities in the JavaScript evaluation that allow malicious websites to, you know, penetrate into the uh, browser kernel, they don't even need to steal your password through some sort of phishing attack, right? I mean, people are a lot dumber than this, right? I had a friend who used to work at Facebook and security, and Facebook had a bunch of problems for a while because people would essentially cut and paste large portions of JavaScript into their web browser. Right? Like, people are that dumb, okay? It's like, you know, click on this link to see the Osama bin Laden death video, right? And what that link actually does is runs in the context of your current Facebook session and sends spam to all of your friends using JavaScript, right? But people are like, ooh, you know, I don't know what this link is. I don't know why this link is like six pages long, but why not? Why not give it a try? Um, so, but, but again, so I, I, let's say I can... I can get you to click on a web page that sends some malicious JavaScript down to your browser, but let's say you don't have any, you know, again, you don't have any passwords or any personal information like credit cards stored in the browser. What else can that code do? Yeah. Yeah, but, but, but again, it's running, remember, the, the, it's running as an application, so I'm assuming that the kernel is getting its security model, right? Yeah. Maybe. I'm thinking of something more fundamental. Yeah. Well, yeah, so you guys have heard of tabs, right? You guys sometimes use like multiple web browsers, tabs, and people do this. So the code that's running in one tab, let's say I've got my actual banking site in tab A and I load some code in tab B that's, that's malicious and exploits a flaw in my browser that allows it to sort of inject code that runs into the browser kernel, that browser kernel can see anything. It's not bound by the cross-site, um, you know, cross-site scripting policies. It can certainly log the keystrokes of me as I enter my username and password into the other tab. Right? So, particularly tabbed environments, you can think of tabs as, you know, apps that are running inside your web browser. Each tab or each new window, if it's running essentially in the same process, represents a new application that the web browser is supposed to run. And one of the things web browsers are supposed to do is isolate those tabs from each other. Otherwise, you know, all ha like if, if a tab could, could access data from an unrelated tab, then all bets would be off. There'd be no way to make tab browsing safe because one website could just, you know, randomly steal stuff from the other website as you type data into it. So that's not supposed to work. That's not supposed to be something that can, can be done. But if the web browser is buggy and I can exploit a vulnerability, then I can do that. 
And so here, you know, the idea is, let's take the JavaScript interpreter in runtime, which it's very unlikely is necessarily I'm going to get right, because JavaScript is a programming language, right? Web browsers include a compiler and a runtime environment. I mean, that's, again, and that thing is compiling JavaScript. <laughs> one of the worst design decisions ever made in human history, right? But we're stuck with it, right? We're living with it now. We're living in that, that, that world that we created. Um, so I can do that, but I can sort of avoid giving it access to some of this underlying, you know, state, right? And, and that's the goal of the microcontroller browser. But as James is pointing out, that still leaves me with these stuck with a particular browser's implementation of a particular standard, right? So I can't necessarily use this to fix some of the cross-browser incompatibility pro uh, problems, because if I have multiple microkernel browsers, they all do things a little bit differently. All right. All right, so, geez, man. does this make sense? So essentially what I'm doing is I'm replacing these um, fixed components that are involved in web page parsing and running JavaScript with components that the page itself specifies. And then, if you'll notice here, the Atlantis kernel interface. So before this interface involved running JavaScript and parsing CSS and interpreting HTML, now it's bitmap rendering. Right? Creating and destroying frames, windows, right? Um, messaging between frames. Like really simple stuff. Low level GUI events like clicks and, and key presses, delivering those uh, to the page. Um, and then, of course, dealing with various types of HTTP sockets that would be 
probably used by most modern web pages by JavaScript libraries to do to sort of create interactive web pages, right? So I've, I've taken this big, buggy, complicated, huge, you know, standard written interface, and I've reduced it down to the tiny, tiny number of things that a web browser really has to allow pages to do. And I can potentially do these very safely, and I've moved all the complexity up until this upper layer, which the page itself, right, can actually specify. So the page knows exactly how its HTML is going to be parsed. All right, so just, so, okay, so let me try to explain what's happening here if you guys haven't done, or don't understand how web browsers work. So, um, again, I mean, the, the, the interactivity of web browsers you guys are used to is entirely due to the fact that there's a programming language called JavaScript that's running in your web browser, and it is able to manipulate the page at runtime. So if you guys use things like Gmail, you, you're, or, or any sort of, basically, if you use a modern web page, you know that this happens. There are changes to the web page that happen that don't, involve you doing anything, right? And even if you do do things, frequently the changes to the web page are caused by JavaScript, right? There's JavaScript that runs in Gmail when you uh, perform a certain action, and it does a bunch of stuff, right? It probably sends a message to the server saying he just, you know, she just archived this message, and then, you know, causes the message to be removed from the list of messages that are in your inbox. That's all JavaScript, but that page is being manipulated at runtime by uh, that, sorry, the page is all HTML. It's being manipulated at runtime by JavaScript. Um, and if you want to see how bad the world is without these features, how many people have tried using Gmail without JavaScript, like the super slow connection version? I don't even know if that's still available. You guys should try that someday and see how much fun it is, because you're going to hate your life within about three minutes. It's really sad. You have to click. You have to hit buttons all the time. It's really terrible. You know, it doesn't refresh itself automatically. It's just not good. Right? So in, in, unless you have a problem with email and email addiction, in which case I would strongly encourage trying that, because it will probably help you. Um, but here what, what's happening is that um, uh, what I'm doing is, let's say there's a comment box on the page, and you've entered some information into that comment box. And what I'm doing is I'm taking the parent um, element, or I'm, or I'm taking some element on the page, and I'm replacing it with the data you typed. So for example, you might have entered something into a comment box, and you hit submit, and you know, in the past, maybe what would have happened is that submit would have caused a post to the web server, and the web server would have responded by redrawing the entire page, but we live in the future now. And so JavaScript does this internally, just updates an element on the page, 
using the data that you've entered. The problem is, if this is poorly done, now there's ways to do this safely, this is a bad example, don't write this code, um, but if this is poorly done by the JavaScript developer or by the website developer, they may have caused the web page to execute JavaScript code in that page's context. So you, and, and this is sort of what created these problems, these certain Facebook vulnerabilities that, that people discovered, right? Was there were ways to get Facebook, if you cut and pasted certain code into Facebook, to run that code, that JavaScript code, as Facebook. So Facebook's JavaScript libraries, because of the cross-site scripting policy, have access to all this inf internal information, all these data structures about you that they use to render the page, things like who your friends are and stuff like that, right? and they can issue requests and queries to the server to find out other stuff, then those queries are coming from the page, and so the server is going to respond to those queries. And so if you can get a website to execute JavaScript code that you wrote, you can exploit that website in all sorts of fun ways. Um, and if that website's a banking website, you can imagine all sorts of nasty things you can do. So this is bad, okay? Um, and this is something that we would like to avoid. So, and James will talk about how you can use Atlantis to avoid this type of thing. Because the thing, the problem is, again, web developers do this stuff. They're, they're not all heroes. All right, so just to try to exp explain this completely. So what I'd like to be able to do is take the JavaScript on the page, take the page, and alter the way the inner HTML property of DOM elements works so that when I assign to it or perhaps when I read from it, I want it to sanitize its content. So I want it to take its content, and there's ways to take that content, and if it's, jo I mean, it's JavaScript, if I can detect it's JavaScript, I could just, you know, fail or crash the page or whatever, but I could also take that JavaScript and run uh, some uh, text replacement on it to convert it to text that is not going to be interpreted by the web browser as JavaScript. So at that point, the web browser would be like, this is weird, I don't know why this person wrote a bunch of JavaScript into the comment box, but that's cool, I'll just put it on the page properly formatted, and they, they, I don't know why. Maybe it's a coding website, maybe that's what they wanted to do, right? Uh, but it won't execute the code as JavaScript, which we're trying to avoid. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll just go through the rest of the slides. So, um, you know, they, they show some performance results. You might think that there's a, uh, a penalty to doing this. It turns out the penalty is pretty, pretty slim um, in most cases. Uh, and you can imagine, and, and look, this is a prototype, so you can imagine optimizing this in the future. Um, and then he goes through some related work. So, any questions about this? I think this is a nice project. Um, really what we talked about. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 so, so, okay, sorry, let me make this clear. This is a developer mistake, right? This is a developer error. But the, the point is that um, it's possible that I want my web browser to fix things like this automatically. Right? My, so I might want to say, this particular version of the DOM tree does not allow inner HTML uh, things to be set to uh, JavaScript or be executed as JavaScript, right? And so the idea is this is, yeah, the, like if I have access to this code, I can fix it, right? If I don't have access to this code, right? Um, and that's why I'm saying, you know, I, I, 
I can just, if I realize this is a problem and people are exploiting this vulnerability, I don't have to wait for developers to fix their web pages, right? With Atlantis, I can just fix the web stack, right? Um, and, and do it that way. Or, or a developer that's worried that their page might have this vulnerability, or, or a, a company that's worried can fix it in one place and then use that runtime on all their web pages and fix all the problems at once, right? So that's, that's the other way this would be. Questions, yeah. Yeah, so there's definitely some penalty the first time. So, so what they do, of course, which is the obvious thing, is they hash this, right? This is sort of like other static browser assets. So the, the question is, do, don't, isn't this going to cause page load times to go up quite a bit because the first time I load a page, it uses a new Atlantis set of libraries. I have to down those libraries and execute them? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think James's argument would be that there aren't going to be very many of these. They aren't going to change that often, and so the penalty is sort of minimal. Because I download it once, and then a bunch of pages use it. And I can keep it around. I can cache it the way I cache other static browser assets. Right. Good question. Yeah? Uh Oh gosh, I, I, I will confess I have not looked at the paper details recently. Um, can you ask the question on Piazza? And I'll answer it. Yeah, sorry. Whoa. I've been caught. Um, yeah, this is just a cool, I, I just like this idea of this paper. The implementation is, is interesting too, though, as well, and I will be happy to answer that question. Other questions? Yeah. Remember, so, so remember, the page gets to specify its own resources, right? This is, this is what's critical to understand about, it's very similar to an exokernel. So an exokernel application can, can uh, be compiled against libraries that are built that use the exokernel interface, but it can use whatever one it wants, right? So this is sort of the dream of exokernels. I could have a Windows flavor library and a Linux flavor library and a BSD flavor library, and an application gets to choose whatever it wants, right? And, and when, it's, when it's loaded, it sort of says, this is the runtime I want to use. Uh, uh, Atlantis is very simple. So pages have full control over this. Can it expose pages to vulnerabilities? Of course, right? That, that, you know, it, again, no one is ever really going to know uh, everything about how a particular library works, particularly a third-party developer, but uh, what, what it would allow you to do is, um, if you're a developer and you want to make sure your, your uh, page is safe, not only do you have a lot more certainty about layout, but you can use a library that's updated frequently that responds to security vulnerabilities. Right? It's a lot easier, so this is another interesting point about this project. It's a lot easier to patch something that gets loaded at runtime than it is to patch the thing that's loading it. Right? So, People may have been ignoring the Windows update thing for weeks and not seeing that there's a new version of IE available, whereas the page can respond immediately. So as soon as there's a vulnerability located, the developer of the library can fix it and the page can get the new, the new code. But this is a huge problem, actually. So just anecdotally, um, this is also something that, that frustrates Google about the Android ecosystem, because Google is very good about patching Android to respond to security problems. But the problem is, they patch it, they release a new version of Android to the vendors, and then it sits there for days, weeks, months sometimes. So they get all, you know, they, they have these security concerns about Android because of something they've known about. They fixed it three months ago, but sadly you don't have it yet because Verizon has not decided to roll a new platform update. And so that's sort of a similar analogy to what would happen in a browser. You have to rely today on Microsoft, Mozilla, Google to fix browser security problems. With this architecture, uh, you don't have to do that. Right? You can get the fix as soon as it's available. And I'm, I'm sorry, you have to rely on those companies to fix the security problems and push updates in a timely way. And to be honest, I mean, how many times do you want Chrome to update per day? Right? Uh, with this, you can update the library much more frequently. That's a good question. All right, so on Friday we'll do 
We're just going to do sort of an open mic, ask me anything style review session for the exam. Uh, hopefully by that point, you guys will be at 90%, uh, and I'll have released half the exam. So I will see you guys on Friday.